I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. Before we start this week's episode of Nexium on Trial, I wanted to take a moment to note that the paper's investigative coverage of Keith Ranieri and his organization was supported primarily by art subscribers whose readership paid the salaries of reporters, copy editors, and digital designers, as well as the lawyers who provided the good counsel that made our work bulletproof against this highly litigious group. If you subscribe to the Times Union, thanks. If you don't, please consider supporting our watchdog reporting. Without you, the truth might never come to light. Oh my God, 120 years, right? And maybe he'll get a few years off for good behavior, but he's never gonna see the outside of the pri- of, of the prison. And that's really what I wanted. You're listening to Nexium on Trial. All right, we are talking Wednesday morning, and on the Zoom call here, I have Brendan Lyons, the Times Union's managing editor for investigations, as well as Rob Gavin, our cops and courts reporter who has covered the trial uh, and the ensuing travails of the case against Keith Ranieri and his Nexium co-defendants. Rob is uh, zooming in from a hotel in Brooklyn where he was on Tuesday watching the fairly epic sentencing of Keith Ranieri. Rob, it went on for hours. If you could elevator pitch it for us, how did yesterday go? I think in many ways it went as expected, a little bit different. I think in the sentencing, uh, I think we probably expected him to get a classic life sentencing, which is what he got. But Judge Garofis, Nicholas Garofis, imposed a 120-year sentence on Keith Ranieri. He's 60 years old. It's just in most humans don't live to be 120 yeah, and 180 alone. So he would need to double his age and then do another 60 years. Very powerful statements coming from several former Nexium members, including a 15-year-old girl in 2005 who uh, Keith Ranieri sexually assaulted and whom he kept child pornography of. And that woman is now 30 years old. She started it off. And what I thought was most significant is, you know, Nobody in the courtroom, at least nobody who covered the trial, has met this woman. We haven't seen her. She was a mystery. She was a huge part of the testimony. But until very recently, when we reported that she was going to appear and likely deliver a statement, we weren't even sure that she was necessarily out of DOS, which she was in for a long time as Keith Ranieri's quote-unquote number one slave. And she gave a very powerful statement, which I to me, uh, really shed a lot of light on where she's at, where she was, where she is now, including a stunning uh, revelation uh, that when she told Keith Ranieri she tried to take her own life, he had said to her, do you have any idea how bad that could have been for me? Really just showing the self-absorbed nature of Keith Ranieri. And that was, what was interesting is in that woman's statement and many statements, you saw a mix. There were people calling him, for instance, Sarah Edmondson called him a predator, a parasite, a grifter. Mark Vicente called uh, him shallow. At times, they were, it was really, you could tell people who knew him as a quote-unquote intellectual really wanted to dress him down for the shallow nature of some of these sexual escapades, illegal ones that he tried to do. And I, and I think one of the more powerful statements came from, you know, I mentioned that there was the woman who was 15 when he began sexually assaulting her. Well, she's one of three sisters who became sexually involved with Keith Ranieri. Her middle sister is a woman who had also had sexual relations with Keith Ranieri. And that woman was the one who was confined to a room with no human contact for nearly two years, all because she dared to kiss another man. Her statement to Keith Ranieri was very powerful in that she basically told him, you don't matter. You're not 
someone who's ever going to be remembered. Yes, you're being remembered now, and now they're talking about you, but you're just one of many bad guys, so to speak. And that was a very powerful statement for someone as narcissistic as Ranieri to be told, you don't matter, I thought came across extremely effective. When the time came for Ranieri to speak, to set the scene, he's dressed in kind of black federal prison garb. He essentially attempted what I think is fair to say was kind of the classic convicted person's non-apology apology, that I'm very sorry that this happened, but not really specifying any crime that he is acknowledging, right? This was even beyond trying to straddle the fence. I mean, it really bordered on the absurd. He kept saying that he was deeply remorseful and I'm so sorry for the pain that I've caused. And then he said, blame me. Don't blame my co-defendants, Allison Mack, Nancy Salzman. He actually didn't mention Kathy Russell, which I thought was kind of interesting. But as he's saying that, as if he's taking the blame, he then says very soon afterward, basically all the victims are liars. What you're saying isn't true. This is just not factual. It's not true, but I feel bad and I feel pain. And by the way, what you're saying is not true. So going back and forth and then throws in there, which I mean, I think many of us knew this anyway. He mentions that Allison Mack cooperated and I'm not sure why he felt the need to just drop that in there. But he mentioned that Allison Mack cooperated, which was not very public, but I think it was known to people who've covered the case. And so just a very, very inconsistent message from Keith Raniere. Uh, I thought he looked like he may have lost a little weight. His hair seemed a little bit grayer. He was back and forth, obviously, in his statements. And he went on for a while, and the judge didn't interrupt him. And I've seen this judge in the past, certainly with lawyers and uh, with Claire Bronfman kind of cut people off. He sort of let Ranieri give his long speech and then obviously spoke with the sentence he imposed. Rob, didn't you get the sense throughout this case that this judge did not like Keith Ranieri? It seemed that, you know, even yesterday, as I understand it, he tangled with his lawyer when the lawyer raised the issue of of whether the child abuse was deliberate. Was that it? It was, you know, yeah. it wasn't his intent. And that's what really made the judge fly off. And, and you've seen it throughout this trial where the judge's, you know, sort of emotion has come through, including, I guess, wiping his eyes at one point during some of the victim's testimony during the trial, right? The judge went off on Mark Agnifilo when the, the attorney was trying to say that Keith didn't have any intent, that he helped a lot of people. And he started getting into you know, the reasons why people believe certain things. And the judge had said, essentially, we're past that stage. We're now at sentencing. I'm going to impose a sentencing. And there was a really interesting interaction there for a while. You know, the woman who had been abused starting at 15, she starts talking about how her lawyer advised her not to cooperate, not to speak to the federal prosecutors. And Mark Agnifilo really got into it over that. The judge was basically saying, like, I'm not sure how this happened, why this woman was under the impression she was not to speak with them. And then it came out that Mark Agnifilo said he believed that those lawyers were probably being paid by the Bronfman uh, uh, money. They were definitely being paid by the Bronfman money. I think that came out early because there was an issue with the conflict of interest pre-trial that they had to, to deal with that. You know, yeah, you have, and you have these victims going to lawyers that the Bronfmans are paying for and Ranieri's, they're on team Ranieri and they're telling the witnesses, no, you shouldn't cooperate. <laughs> so it's, that, it's really interesting. And what I thought was interesting is she said in court that she was advised during the trial by her former lawyer not to speak with the government and quote unquote, stay invisible. And then she said, but I've recognized the power I hold and I'm ready to reclaim my voice and stand up for myself. Like almost every victim of Keith Raniere in their testimony, this woman said that at the start, she was not comfortable with Keith Raniere. This is a recurring theme where women who have been abused by Keith Raniere, you hear them talk and it's not like, oh, I saw this person and I was immediately gaga and love they say they were uncomfortable around him we heard that from lauren salzman we heard that from many many victims and this woman said the same thing and then we later heard i thought very powerful statements from india oxenberg and another woman whose name we haven't identified who 
Keith Raniere had strapped to a table, blindfolded, and ordered her to basically lie down as uh, another slave in DOS, who's actually the, the former 15-year-old, performed a sex act on her. And she told Keith Raniere that she was not attracted to him, that she never would have come to Albany had she not been commanded to. Unfortunately, that is a recurring theme of people saying, I didn't, wouldn't go to Albany if not for Nexium. But she and India Oxenberg both made it very clear that if not for the collateral, meaning the, you know, the blackmail material, they wouldn't have done this. And India Oxenberg actually said to Keith Raniere that he, quote unquote, raped her. There were very powerful statements. But you also had people like, like I say, you know, Mark Vicente really tore into Raniere's sort of intellectual facade, uh, saying to him at one point, you were trying to put together this quote unquote recommitment ceremony where a bunch of women were going to perform a sex act on Ranieri. And Vicente just says, you know, how shallow are you? And I think that was something that came out. This was a, a real time for people I think had wanted to unload for a while. And you definitely saw that. Many, many people just ripped into him. At one point, one of the victims had said to Keith, not that you want to make light of it, but this was a moment where a lot of people, I think, almost laughed. This woman said to Keith that you kept claiming and claiming and claiming that you needed to have sex constantly to maintain all this energy. And then she said, Keith, you've been, you've been in, locked up now for two years. How are you still alive? And, and there was some of that. People taking digs. Uh, Tony Natale took some real digs at him, calling him lazy, told him that he was essentially someone who was just going to be, you know, have other people do things for him. I also thought it was interesting that Tony Natale took some shots at Nancy Salzman at one point calling her Bub. There was a few people, much like at Claire Bronfman sentencing, people took digs at Ranieri. There were some digs at Nancy Salzman. And what's interesting about that is we will uh, have to see what time she gets, but I don't think anything could be quite as emotional as what we saw yesterday. There was a lot of people who were holding a lot of stuff in for a long time and they let it out yesterday. Okay, we're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. If you're enjoying Nexium on trial, be sure to check out its sister podcast, The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall, host of The Eagle. Each week, we'll take a look inside the newsroom at the Times Union, the capital region's oldest and largest newspaper. We'll discuss the week's top stories, and we'll talk to the award-winning reporters who write them. Listen at timesunion.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Nexium on Trial. Brendan, what's kind of next here? We have sentencings coming up of many of the people that Rob just mentioned. Kathy Russell, who's the bookkeeper in Nexium, Allison Mack, who cooperated but was also essentially kind of Raniere's contractor, as it were, in setting up DOS. The Salzmans, uh, Nancy, the president of Nexium, known as Prefect, and Lauren Salzman, who did testify at trial. And of course, Raniere has, has made it clear, as has Claire Bronfman, that there will be appeals of their convictions. So I think you're not going to see probably as heavy sentences as you saw with Claire Bronfman receiving a six-year sentence and Raniere with his 120-year sentence. For one, there has been no remorse on their part. And as Rob knows and any reporters cover courts, judges do not look fondly on defendants who do not accept responsibility. And Rainier did not. These other defendants, it appears, one, they may not have crimes that crossed over into sex trafficking, which is, is going to, to lower the guidelines for them. So I don't think you'll see them receive the same level, but I do expect them to receive prison time. It's likely. The other thing is that came out, and it's come out before, I, you know, through reporting and through our stories is that you see the influence of Ranieri and his effect on full families, the destruction. The young lady from Mexico, that was a well-to-do family with three bright daughters who are honor students and on their way to, to greatness, and they get tangled up with Ranieri's world. And the father and one of the sisters are still loyal to him, and that family was destroyed, that family network. And those are the types of victimizations 
that I think resulted in Ranieri getting a life sentence yesterday. It was beyond branding in that this was, I think the judge was probably more influenced by those types of victimizations than he was by the branding of women, although that was a horrible thing too that went, that went on. The one part of Ranieri's appeal that lawyers have told me could be problematic was when a witness was being cross-examined by the defense and she began to become very emotional and upset and Garof has cut off that cross-examination. That, and I don't know what you think of that, Rob, but I think that could be problematic. The question is, was that inability to fully question that witness by the defense enough to result in a new trial or to say that this, this case is flawed, the jury was biased because they didn't get to hear the rest of that testimony or whatever he may have drawn from that witness? Yeah, that was uh, Lauren Salzman. And when her testimony became extremely emotional and she was very, very, very upset as she spoke, I think Keith Ranieri's attorney, Mark Agnifilo, was asking her about the fact that hadn't you done this, you know, hadn't you done that? And she broke down and the judge was very concerned about her, her well being. I mean, she was extremely upset. He had given a, a lot of cross examination, but you raise a really good point. You know, at some point during that exchange, the judge said to Agnifilo, and I believe the jury was in the room, and he said, you know, this is not Doss. You know, that's a human being, and she has feelings. I remember that line specifically. It jumped out at you. Yeah, the judge did not hide his emotions here. He made it very clear before the time came to even impose sentencing. I think everybody knew Keith Ranieri was not going to get any sort of mercy from this judge based on what you saw of the Claire, his comments during Claire Bronfman's sentencing and the fact that he was clearly just appalled at Ranieri's behavior and, and like you said, his lack of remorse to the point where he's essentially and his supporters who are remaining have painted him as a victim of, of a malicious prosecution. So I think that all factors in. I, I do think that issue of the cross-examination of Lauren Salzman, I think that is probably the, the, the biggest issue on appeal. Is it going to be enough to get him a new trial? I mean, you know, you know, a lot of times attorneys will talk about sometimes when somebody is considered such a bad guy, so to speak, it takes a lot got to be something egregious to have an overturn but you know we are in a you know a time when people are looking very strongly at the issues of what they might consider prosecutorial misconduct in cases where it exists and i'm certainly not saying that happened here i know the prosecution and many observers just say the allegations that keith ranieri is some kind of a victim is outlandish and actually ironic considering the fact that nexium's teachings were that there are no victims i will not allow myself to be a victim the thing about Nancy, so she comes in in March 2019 and is the first defendant to plead guilty in the case. And she does so without notice to any of the co-defendants. They, even her own daughter was unaware, apparently, that she was going to plead guilty. And Nancy had said it was really short of an apology, it seemed. It was, you know, taking some time and some soul searching to come to this place. And she, like even some of Ranieri's victims had made the comment, I still believe some of what we did was good. But the thing with Nancy Salzman's case is that there were also allegations in the indictments that were filed that she had enabled Ranieri, was aware of his sexual abuse of these young people and had facilitated that through allowing them you know, to be hidden. And, and because Nancy knew so much, she was his right hand. Now, they never said publicly that she cooperated. She did not testify. She may have cooperated privately with prosecutors, but that would presumably come out at sentencing if that's the case. The judge would probably have to cite that as a reason to not give her time if he doesn't. I think that of the remaining defendants, the, the question of what punishment will be handed down to Nancy Salzman is probably the biggest one, the biggest unknown. And I think with Nancy, too, what's interesting is that, you know, we have to remember the last thing that the prosecution played before the case went to the jury was that really chilling video in which Keith Raniere talks about age of consent and that some children are, quote unquote, perfectly happy having sex with adults. 
it's worth mentioning that we heard that earlier in the trial from Nancy, who was talking at a Jeunesse meeting at the Apropos restaurant in Half Moon, where she is read, she's quoting Ranieri and certainly not appalled at it and sort of presenting it like, wow, I didn't know that to the large crowd. So, I mean, the judge knows that even though Nancy was not involved in DOS and sex trafficking, that she was endorsing Keith Ranieri's pedophilic views to other people and sort of normalizing them. And she was, a, like you mentioned, a chief enabler of him for years and years. And we also shouldn't you know, discount the fact that her basement was full of boxes of quote unquote perceived enemies of Nexium, a huge part of what made this such a scary enterprise. And there's a lot of people who I think would very much want to speak about her culpability in all of this. And it'll be certainly something to watch. I got a very thoughtful email from a listener to this podcast who noted that she was enjoying it, but that one thing that was missing from it was the voice of a woman, of a female journalist to kind of, to comment on this material. Jen Gish, who worked with Jim Odato on the 2012 Secrets of Nexium series that really blew out a lot of the issues, including the sexual abuse of underage women, is no longer at the Times Union, unfortunately, a terrific journalist. That was a fair, a fair criticism, without a doubt. And it brought to mind, as I was reading Rob's story on Tuesday night, that as you ably put it, Rob, Ranieri's cruelty was couched in the language of self-improvement, these kind of, you know, smooth bromides about not being a victim and, you know, taking responsibility for your own life. And it struck me that what happened Tuesday with the majority, I think with the exception of Mark Vicente, all of the victims who spoke were women, correct? There was also the brother of, of the three sisters, and he, he also was a victim of Nexium because he had, was also uh, working there. But he also spoke. But you're absolutely right. The vast majority of the people who were victimized by Keith Ranieri were all women. And, and that's really the company he kept. If you talk to people in Knox Woods, the townhouse development where uh, so many Nexium members lived, he, he was seen walking around that townhouse development with lots of women around him at all times. and that's who he aimed his misogyny at. Brendan, any kind of last thoughts is, you know, Ranieri's fall is now, is now complete. This has been something that has been going on for decades. It's a story that the Times Union has been covering for almost two decades now. You know, we went back and looked through the clips. The first mention of Keith Ranieri in the Times Union is, I think, from 1988, when he, you know, reported that he had won a kind of entrance into a mega genius organization. It's a rainy Wednesday morning, but it's also kind of the end of a very long road. It is. It's, it's arguably not illegal to run a cult, but there was so much information that the Times Union and other news organizations laid at the feet of law enforcement and even the Nixium, you know, devotees through the years. It was always shocking to me that this didn't happen sooner and that it took branding and Ranieri really coming off the rails and taking it to a new level for him to be outed. I think in many ways, when our 2012 series hit and Ranieri was left standing, that it emboldened him to go further, to take this into an even deeper, darker place. Throughout all of this, my, my view of Ranieri has been that He's someone with deep-seated mental health issues who I still believe that the reason he forced women in many ways to become emaciated, to stay under 100 pounds, that was always a theme throughout his career. If you look at many of the women he was with, rail thin, I still think he was trying to make them look like the middle school girlfriend who turned him down and that he kind of, it shaped his life. And all of this, is, as Mark Vicente once said, He said suddenly the lights went on and he realized all they've been doing is guarding the door of a brothel for this guy. So it's just shocking to me that it went on for so long and that even the Nixingham devotees didn't have an uprising sooner. That that might have been his undoing. It's shocking when you look back, and I've looked back at those clips too, 
going back to 1988, early 2003, where Dennis Yusko was writing about Nexium wanting to build a commune type center. And you just watch the progression. And I know I definitely was one of those people who read the Secrets of Nexium by uh, Jim Adato and uh, Jen Gish. And I, and I looked at that and thought, oh, wow, there's going to be an indictment on, on these people any day now. And it just never happened. And and at one point yesterday, Kristen Keith, who offered a victim impact statement, former Nexium member, mentioned that she went to state police and thought stuff was going to happen. And that never happened. It's really kind of amazing to look at like all the time and all the stories that the Times Union has put out there and, and the fact that this was out and it was in the public eye and everybody knew about them. And it just took this long. It is sort of amazing to think that, wow, we actually are at this time that Keith Trenuri is going to prison for 120 years and he's never getting out bearing a successful appeal. All right. Well, that's where we're going to leave it. So thanks very much to Brendan Lyons, uh, the Times Union's managing editor for investigations, and Rob Gavin from the Wilds of Brooklyn, our Cops and Courts reporter. I am reminded, speaking of the outstanding uh, woman journalists who have worked on this story, that Jess Marshall, our multimedia producer, though you will not hear her voice on this podcast, helps to shape it every week, which is no small task. She also works on our outstanding sibling podcast, The Eagle, that we also highly recommend. So I think that's it for this episode of Nexium on Trial, certainly the closing of a door in so many ways. Thanks a lot to uh, all who have listened. There is sure to be more news coming out of this story, and we thank you for paying attention to it.